nice to be home. I, um, several weeks ago, went to a wedding in California. Um, my sister, who died in, when she was 36, quite a few years ago, her, her grandson was going to be married to, uh, to a man in California. And uh, all of our family, fortunately, there is a flight from Columbus to San Francisco direct. And we were glad they arranged that for us. And uh, so we headed for California. And I found out something while we were there that uh, this church influences travels a long distance. Um, we asked the people, a large contingency of Vietnamese people, since the groom was Vietnamese, um, we asked them if there were Vietnamese who would like to be there or they'd like to have them there, that if they would just call out their name and we would welcome them to come to this wedding. Since I um, am not real good at Vietnamese names, I asked my daughter to assist. Is my daughter here? Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the wedding. I, I wonder if there are people here that you would like to be in the service this morning and you would just call out their name right now. I find it rather scary in the neighborhood this time of year. We have um, quite a few decorations. There's it's down the street from us is a ghost that almost hides the house behind it. <laughs> it's huge. I took a good look at it. The next day I went by and it was gone. But I noticed that uh, it had snowed the night before, and then I looked carefully, and that ghost was spread all over the front yard. Somebody <laughs> had let the air out of it. There's another house in the circles that has a casket on the porch, and I don't know what's inside. I haven't gone up to take a look. But I know that when you walk by the house, there are a lot of sounds coming from that front porch. <laughs> Things are scary in our neighborhood. Our neighbors, Emerson, has three witches in their front yard, dressed in black, standing in a circle. I, uh, I've tried to avoid walking by there with those witches in case, um, well, I don't, you know, you can never count on witches. And <laughs> I used to park on 6th, and I decided I wasn't going to walk by those witches. I'd park on Neil. 
when I could find a place. And uh, as it turned out, I discovered that those witches standing in a circle were holding hands. It must have had been connected with King Avenue. <laughs> I don't know if this is true or not, but uh, I thought I heard them the other night singing Kumbaya. <laughs> I, I like the way the neighborhood celebrates Halloween. When I was a child, I was afraid of the Halloweeners that came to the house. I got under the dining room table and looked through the lace tablecloth, and there I felt safe when the Halloweeners would come to the door. And then, um, I needed to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and it was upstairs. I had to walk right by the front door and go upstairs. And I prevailed on one of my sisters to go with me to protect me. <laughs> and on the way up the steps, I said, I want you to stand outside the bathroom door. You're not to come in the bathroom. So after a couple of minutes, I said, are you out there? And she said, yes, I'm out here. I said, okay, I'm gonna open this door a little bit. You stick your arm in, and I'll know you're still there. I like the way the Bible tells the story of scary things. When um, Elisha and Elijah were walking along, Elijah said to Elisha, what do you want from me? And he said, I want you to bless me. And Elijah said, if you see me, go. In other words, if you can be present when I die and not be sad, then you will receive my blessing. And they saw this uh, thing coming out of the sky, and it suddenly went between them. And Elisha turned to Elijah, and Elijah wasn't there. And he realized that he had gone with those chariots into the heavens. Like the songwriters take us to a great place when they, they do the song. Um, Swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. I looked over Jordan and what did I see? A band of angels coming after me, coming forth to carry me home. When I was in an African-American church in Cincinnati, there was uh, one of the first funerals that I had when I was there was a teacher in her 40s. The church was filled with students and friends and family. And as they came to the end of the service, people began to, as the casket was pushed out of the church, people began to follow the casket, singing, soon and very soon, we are going to meet the king. And all the way down the aisle of the church and all of the people and into the street, I liked the way the church uh, alleviates our fears. 
my uh, <coughs> sister wanted me to get over being afraid of Halloweeners. Oh, she said, you, you stand behind me and I'll take your arm and I'll hold on to you. But I want you to stand here when the next Halloweeners come. Frightfully, I stood behind her and I looked. And when they were gone, she said, what did you see? And I said, I saw somebody whose pants were rolled up underneath their costume and they had plaid pants. I said, that's just like Jim Sickler wears. And my sister said, that was Jim Sickler. <laughs> Wilbert Smucker had a good way of dealing with death. He, he said to his grandchildren, when I die, I'm just going to look dead. They'll have me up there in a casket, and I'll just be there, and I'll just have my eyes closed, but I'll be able to hear everything you say. <laughs> Wilbur was a very wise man. You can imagine when the grandchildren came, what a good time they had, telling him jokes, trying to get him to laugh. One said, I'll punch him, and he pushed him in the side. When I was a child, as I say, I was afraid of those things. Thirty years ago, I received a call from the district superintendent saying, are you willing to move? And I said, where to? And he said, I can't tell you until you say you're willing to move. <laughs> I said, I'll talk with Wendy about it tonight. Well, we talked about it and decided we would move. I guess part of it was curiosity. And um, the next morning I called him and said, yes, we're willing to move. He said, well, the church is King Avenue in Columbus. And he said, the introduction will be Wednesday. It was then Monday. <laughs> and I said, look, you didn't even know if I was going to move, and you set up an introduction already. He said, well, the bishop felt that your name was written all over that church and that you should go there. And if you said no, she was going to do some bishoping. <laughs> he said, so I set up the introduction. It was right back there in the parlor. It was a good evening, and uh, Cindy Garn found a house for rent in the neighborhood and told us about it. It's where we live now. We moved in there. We had the first service. The choir had stayed over an extra Sunday, and they sang, um, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. It was magnificent. Jim Linker directed it. Sweat was rolling down his face, and I, I thought I detected some tears in his eyes. I knew I had them in mind. After the first Sunday, on that Monday morning, I went into the office, and the office manager said, there's somebody that wants to see you. I told them to take a seat in the office, that you'd be here soon. I went in, and there was Brad Colgate. He said, how do you feel about gay people in the church? And I said, well, the United Methodist Church says that gay people are of sacred worth and should have a full place in the church. He said, well, 
there's a group of us meet once a month for lunch and a Bible study and and he said, uh, we usually sit around trying to figure out what the new minister thinks and how we will be received. And this time we decided we didn't want to do that. We just asked the minister and he said, I drew the short straw. <laughs> said, so uh, I know we're interested in what the United Methodist Church says, but what do you say? And I said, I, I feel pretty much the same. He said, good, I'll tell the group Sunday. I'm sure they'll be glad to hear that. And I said, may I come to the group? He said, I don't know, it's a closed group. Uh, we don't advertise it. And uh, he said, let me check with the group. A little later, I got a call saying, it's okay for you to come to this one. When I got there, there were about three people. I thought, this isn't much of a group. <laughs> but by the time we were to eat, there were over 20 in the kitchen. And I found out later that some had stayed back in other rooms to see what it was going to be like for the new minister to come and if they wanted really to be a part of that. I told them that day that I didn't know a whole lot about gay people, but I was willing to learn if they would teach me. And I said, I understand that there's a lot of silence in the church about gays. And I said, if I'm, if I'm going to take a stand, then you're going to have to do it with me. And he said, um, okay, let us think about that. A couple of weeks later, it was Carson and Helen Haney's 50th wedding anniversary. I wanted to recognize them in the worship service. They were married in this church. They were wonderful people. So when I uh, said to them, I'd like to do it during the worship service, they said, do it during children's moments. And I said, okay. So I decided that that would be the moment I would come out a little bit. And I said, um, there are all kinds of people in the church. Carson and Helen were married here, and they've never had any children, but they're a family. I said, sometimes there's a man and children, and that's a family, and sometimes there's a woman and children, and that's a family. There are all kinds of families, sometimes two men, sometimes two women, but whatever kind of family they are, they are welcome and loved by King Avenue Church. Later that day, I received a call from the staff parish chair, Bob Heber. He said, Reverend Atha, I think you committed ministerial suicide this morning. I had an idea of what he was talking about, but I asked him and he told me, and he said, I've, I've called a meeting of the committee for Tuesday night. Will you be there? And I said, I don't miss staff parish meetings. I missed one one time. Told them to go ahead and meet without me. They changed the time of the worship service. <laughs> Moved the pulpit from one side of the front to the other side. I haven't missed a pastor parish meeting since then. There was a good turnout for that meeting. They had gotten wind what it was about. 
sometimes half of the committee shows up, sometimes a third or two thirds, but this night everybody was there on time. And then something happened that I had never experienced before. Bob Heber said, I have received 18 calls. I'm going to tell you who was each call and what they said. I have it written out. Then when I'm done, I'd like for each of you to say what you think. In staff parish meetings that I'd been in, I've heard people say, well, a party said to me, or somebody told somebody who didn't want to, their name mentioned, but wanted you to know this. Never have I heard the names given and what they said. And when he was all done, he started around the group. Brad Colgate was the first one, and he said, when I was in junior high, I went to church, and they had boy-girl relations, boy-girl parties. He said, and I suddenly realized I was more attracted to boys than the girls. And he said, I didn't know what was going on. And I, uh, I didn't think I could go to the library, and I didn't think I could ask my pastor. He said, so I prayed God would change me. And when God did not change me, I just quit going to church. He said, when I came to the university, somebody mentioned to me about King Avenue Church, and he said, I decided to come. And I started participating in the activities of the church. But he said, I noticed that though we did feel welcome, we understood we weren't to say much because people may leave the church or become disillusioned. When he was finished, Bob started going around the group, and one person said, I have a brother who's gay. And another one said, you know, we have a cousin who committed suicide, and we don't know why, but some in the family think it was because they were gay and couldn't find their way and didn't want to live. The meeting went for two hours. When it was over, there were a lot of tears and laughing. People were hugging. And I thought the storm had passed. But it, I soon realized the storm clouds were just gathering. As the days went by, There were a lot of conversations that went on. People would come in the office and knew that they had the arguments that I couldn't resist and would tell me about it or say that if we didn't change, we were going to leave the church. I kind of put as a change moment that meeting of the staff parish committee. It was the first time that we talked openly about gays in the church. And when, when the time passed and we began to talk more about it and even came to the time when Sometimes a gay person would get up and talk in the church 
about being gay and how they felt at home in the church. Sometimes people even clapped. John Shipley, who I hope somebody invited to be here today, was in his 80s and was a wonderful person, but you had to get by the gruffness of him. And he said to me, Reverend, when's a heterosexual going to get up and say they come to King Avenue Church and tell us about their life? I said, John, um, you know, some gay people cannot have pictures of their loved ones on their desk at work. Some, even some have their families have uh, disowned them. And I said, you know, when they get up and they can talk to a group of people and tell about their life and receive a, a welcome, he said, Reverend, stop. You don't have to go any further. I get it. But there were a lot more conversations. We could lose that, you know. You heard this morning that King Avenue was voted as a church that was easiest place to hold hands. We could lose that, you know. We could lose it by becoming complacent. We could lose it by people saying, well, I would like to sleep in on Sunday morning. And drift away from the church. I'm tired of giving money to help the building to be better, to fix the stained glass windows. I'm tired of giving money to the general fund. It's one thing after the other. When is all of this going to stop? And the answer was, it's never going to stop. That's a part of who we are. That's a part of having a place where it's the best place to hold hands, because we are committed to what's happening in this place. Why come to church? Well. It's the choir. The choir is great. <laughs> Why come to church? Well, you know, the bells. We like the bells. And on and on. But that banner that hangs on the front of the church says quite a bit about it. We come to church because we have become a beacon in this community where all are welcome. And no one needs to feel that they are an outcast. We cannot, we must not let that get away. You have provided a wonderful place, uh, a home. You've provided a, a welcome place. As, as one couple who came here said, we were both raised in the church, but living together, we, we didn't know about what to do when we went to church. So we started going to churches and 
we would sit in the back and we'd slip out as soon as the service was over because we didn't want to talk to anyone. We surely didn't want anyone to ask us to run the youth group or to teach a Sunday school class. She said then when we came to King Avenue, when we came to this neighborhood, he said the person working on our house, Tim Fiss, said, why don't you try King Avenue? And they said when we walked in here, it was like we had come home. It was then that the gay um, and friends lunch happened every month. And she said, not only did we find a place that we were welcome, but they fed us. <laughs> what I'm saying to you, there are babies to be baptized. I remember two mothers who wanted their baby baptized, and I was curious how two mothers would have a baby. So I thought, well, ask them. You have a meeting with them before the baptism? So I did, and they got out a book, showed a whole lot of males, and said, you pick the one you want, and then they will sell you the sperm. And that's how we had a baby. I remember standing here with that baby, holding it high above the heads of this congregation, and said, we'll help this baby to come to know and to love God. We can't let that get away. There are more babies to be baptized. There are more children to be nurtured. There are more who feel outcasts that need to know that there is a place for them. You all have done a marvelous job in making this a welcoming place. So, as you think about it, I want you to think about how you can help this continue to be a strong and welcoming place. I know it's easy to sleep in on Sunday morning. I know it's easy to find other things to do with your money. I know it's easy to find excuses why too much has been asked of you. But what a wonderful place you have made. What a wonderful beacon in this community. And since there are more babies to be baptized and more children to be nurtured and more outcasts who need a place. Make sure that that does not get away. Why do you come to church? Because everyone is welcome. And we want that to live on and on and on. May God's presence be with us, God of grace, and God of glory, let us sing together.